so far, we've seen how ticks live their lives and we got to know how they can kill us and our pets with the diseases they sometimes carry. But now, it's time to take a stand and tell ticks to go f*** Also, maybe to actually do something against them. So, let's learn some more about the breathtaking adventures of ticks and their calculated demise. This is part 3. First, you need to make a priority list and it should look somewhat like this. 1. Prevent tick-borne diseases. 2. Prevent tick-borne diseases, in caps. Maybe swear a little to give it some weight. 3. Prevent tick bites. And 4. Remove slash kill feeding ticks. As it happens, accomplishing number 3 is the easiest way to deal with 1 and 2, but number 4 can most certainly help as well. So if you feel like leaving your friendly concrete environment and go somewhere disgustingly green, try to avoid bushy areas with tall grass. If you can't, wear long clothing and tuck your trouser legs into your socks until you look like a complete idiot and your friends go, dude, what the f***, it's the middle of summer, but you won't really care while having a heat stroke, will you? Treating your skin or your clothing with an appropriate tick repellent or tick killer product is probably a more effective option. Some people swear that taking high doses of vitamin B1 will prevent ticks from biting you, but there's no solid scientific evidence to support this claim so far. When you get home, take a shower to remove any unattached ticks, then check your body for attached ones. Ask a family member to look at parts of your body you can't reach. If you live alone, ask a neighbor or your local representative. Remember, ticks are hard to notice, especially the young ones. Good eyesight and good lighting are of key importance. Tumble dry or wash your clothes at a high temperature. The heat will destroy stowaway ticks and possibly some of your clothes as well. Some of the aforementioned safety measures may not all be realistic in all situations, so if you have the crazy idea of enjoying your trip to nature at least a little bit, you may have to compromise and stick to methods you can actually carry out. There are indirect methods too, like if you have a beautiful lush garden, you could just turn it into a concrete parking lot. That'll show those damn ticks who's boss. Alternatively, cut the grass short. By spraying the perimeter of your garden with tick killers, you can establish a chemical barrier. And also kill plenty of innocent bugs in the process. Woohoo! When it comes to protecting pets, our tactics are different. We focus on long-term solutions, ranging from weeks to months, with the aim of repelling or killing ticks or to satiate our bloodthirst, repelling and killing ticks. <laughs> Protective medication comes in several alternatives, with one big group acting topically on the body surface and the other systemically, circulating in the pet's blood. As a consequence, topically working products affect ticks on contact, while systemics require the tick to suck blood first in order to poison it, this means, by definition, that systemics cannot repel ticks, only topicals can, but both are capable of killing the parasite. Why is this distinction important? Because we want to prevent tick-borne diseases, f damn it. Now, killing the tick quickly after it starts feeding is almost as good at blocking disease transmission as preventing tick bites is in the first place. But as the old Hungarian saying goes, almost is the third favorite word of the devil, right after tick-borne encephalitis and nincompoop. So why would anyone pick systemics when topicals are also available? That's because the usage of anti-tick products has a lot of practical sides as well, and in some cases, under some circumstances, systemics are a better choice. For more details, check out my video on antiparasitic products. The most important long-acting formulations are medicated collars, spot-ons and tablets. 
In many cases, these are combination products, meaning they work against several external or even internal parasites. But be aware that their duration of effect against ticks might be shorter than against fleas, mosquitoes and whatnot. Just read the leaflet before instantly tossing it in the trash. It's long and boring, but there's always a treasure map on the back. Arr. Short-term solutions also exist, but in general their usefulness is not on par with the long-acting ones. So why aren't there any spot-ons, collars or pills for humans if they're so good? First of all, our daily bathing habits would ruin the effectiveness of most topical products. They wouldn't affect systemics though, but we don't have those either. Why? For one, almost nobody likes the idea of having to let the tick bite you first and then having to wait for it to die while binge-watching Star Trek. You'd probably still go with it if you were subjected to hundreds of tick attacks on a daily basis when running around naked in the bushes and rolling into some wild animal's poop in tall grass like a smart dog. But since we only occasionally need protection against ticks, most of us would rather just take the hassle of short-term prevention. All in all, the market is too small for pharmaceutical companies to invest in researching long-acting protective solutions. Let's suppose that in the face of all precautions, or due to the lack of them, you find a tick attached to yourself or to your pet. What to do then? Myth number four. A tick should be removed by dousing it in soapy water, gasoline, nail polish, alcohol, vaseline, rubbing matches around it, burning it, impaling it, or invoking the wrath of Zeus upon it. The most you can expect with these methods is a dead tick still attached to you. You see, ticks are not in the habit of letting go before their bellies are full, no matter the circumstances. Unless they are males searching for mates, of course. They'll also leave if you die, but maybe that's taking it a step too far just to get rid of a parasite. To remove a tick, brute force is necessary. Gentle brute force, I might add, the kind you'd slap your grandmother with. Use fine tweezers or a special tick remover tool to grab the tick by its mouthparts as close to the skin as possible. Don't grab the body and don't use your fat fingers unless you want to press the tick's gut contents into yourself along with any pathogens they might contain. Now, pull on the tick slowly until it releases your skin. A few twists may also do the trick, but you're going to need a firm grip for that, else your repeated grabs and regrabs will just break off the mouth parts. Myth number 5. If you leave the mouth parts in, they can infect you with tick-borne diseases. Uh, no. Broken off mouth parts don't pose any considerable threat. They are like a small splinter under your skin. Sure, they could act as an entry point for secondary bacterial infections, but those are usually localized and result in your body eventually rejecting the mouth parts. Myth number 6. If you leave the mouth parts in, they'll regrow the whole body. Are you f***ing kidding me? Once the tick is out, disinfect the bite wound and dispose of the parasite. Please resist the urge to squash it between your fingernails, splattering potentially diseased tick guts and blood everywhere. I know, the popping sound is very satisfying, but that's what bubble wrap was invented for. Methods of disposing of ticks include putting them in airtight containers with cotton balls soaked in rubbing alcohol, wrapping them in tape and throwing them in the trash, crushing them with rocks or sticks, burning them or flushing them down the toilet. All of them have their pros and cons, I'll leave you some time to read them while I uh, just uh, take care of this bubble wrap. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. Oh yes! <laughs> Whether or not you should have the removed ticks tested for diseases is a frequent question. The short answer is, if you'd like to satisfy your curiosity, sure. Medical treatment options, however, will generally not be based on these test results, rather on symptoms shown by the host, if there are any, and on lab work performed on them. A positive tick doesn't mean you got infected, and a negative one isn't a guarantee you didn't. 
you might have overlooked one or more other ticks, especially in pets, and there's of course the occasional false negative result. But if you're just dying to know and want to annoy your doctor at the same time, go ahead. Summing it up. Ticks are widespread blood-sucking parasites of many vertebrate species, including your pets and yourself as well. On their own, they don't pose much of a threat, but they can carry and transmit diseases you wouldn't even wish upon your enemies. Well, maybe upon your enemies you would. <laughs> The best way to protect yourself and your pets against these diseases is to prevent tick infestation in the first place. For people, temporary safety measures are the favored approach, but for pets, long-acting tick control is the most reliable method. Hey, I came up with a solution to the conflict between general volatility and quantum mechanics that is so painful present at the moment of the big bang on its... <laughs> The technical information in this video was fact-checked by Catherine Reif, expert in ticology. I thank her very much, as much as I thank Siva for its support. If you've made it this far, why not like, comment or subscribe, or check out my other videos. I know it would make at least one of us happy.